Welcome to our conversation on the state of climate investing. I'm Caitlin McMahon, Head of Investor Partnerships at Galvanize Climate Solutions. Today, I'm joined by our co-executive chair, Tom Steyer, and Innovation Expansion co-head, Saloni Multani. Tom, why don't you kick off the conversation? What does it mean to invest in climate solutions? Thanks, Caitlin. Climate investing means putting money into companies and projects that increase the scope and pace of decarbonization and prepare us for a net zero world. Given that the use and generation of energy is endemic to virtually every human endeavor around the globe, that creates an opportunity that is absolutely vast. When we think about solving this problem, we're talking not only about global scope, but so many different opportunities for investment that it's truly unique. The urgency, the necessity of this problem creates an immense investment tailwind. And so when we think about what we're trying to accomplish here, we need trillions of dollars to be devoted every single year for the foreseeable future into solving this problem. And that's something which Saloni and I really are here, and it's why you're here, is for us to come together and put that kind of capital to meet the best of these opportunities so that as a group, we can respond in, from the private sector standpoint to this problem. And let me say, this is going, we're in the execution phase. You know, I've spent a lot of time thinking and working on climate, and we're at a pl place now where we have to get it done. And when we think about what gets it done on a global scale, it's really capitalism. Capitalism scales. If you have a terrific company that's growing and throwing off cash, that is something that's going to attract investment dollars on a global scale. Of course, this is going to have to be done in conjunction with the public sector, with governments around the world. This is a society-wide response. But we're here talking about climate investing. And that's something where there's immense urgency, there's immense size ne needed, and really, it's a historic need to turn things around and get us to a safe place. It's going to be the private sector that takes the lead. Well, and Tom, you say turn things around. I think, you know, the magnitude of the transition that, you know, what we've had historically is a relationship between population growth and emissions, where emissions intensity per capita has actually increased. And what we're going to need to do is see that decouple. So we're going to need to do it fast, and we're going to need to fundamentally change what it means to grow. I think there's no question that what we're going to have to do is be able to replace economic activity as it's done today with better, cheaper, faster economic activity that is also safe and green. Yeah. And I think it's something where we have to get started now. We have to make real progress over the next two, five, 10 years. If we're going to meet our 2050 promises, they're just promises. Unless we have real plans and make real progress, then our ability to meet those promises is going to be dramatically diminished. That's the nicest way to put it. Really, we have to make progress right now so that, that it's possible for us to get to a net zero world in 2050. And I think we need to be anticipating what we're going to need to continue to deploy solutions at the pace we need to deploy in 2040, 2050, lay that foundation today so that we can really set ourselves up. I, I don't think there's any, look, this is a huge challenge. It's also a historic opportunity from an investment standpoint. This is a dramatic tailwind. The urgency means it's not whether we succeed, it's just a question of how are we gonna make this succeed because it's absolutely essential that we do so. We just heard Tom and Sloney make the case that climate is permeating all segments of our lives. Sloney, can you break that down for us? How should we think about different climate companies? Sure. So I generally like to start by just kind of having two big categories that are companies that address climate resilience and companies that address climate mitigation. And so what do those two words mean? Well, resilience is thinking about how we as humanity, we as living things are going to continue to adapt, thrive, survive in a world that is going to see increasing physical change and ramifications of climate change. And so what could those companies look like? 
You know, there are businesses that are deploying proprietary hardware coupled with machine learning to help identify early wildfires so first responders can get to them quickly. There are uh, companies in precision agriculture that are helping farmers productively farm on land that might be drought impact, degraded, but continuing to drive ROI and the food we need to eat from that you know, increasingly tougher terrain. Um, there are software tools that you know, climate scientists, data scientists are working on to try to predict where climate events or climate exacerbated events might hit. So we can evacuate early, we can allocate resources appropriately, we can price that risk appropriately, so we can continue to have you know, a functioning society and also functioning capital markets and risk markets in the context of um, increasingly expensive climate events. So that's resilience. You know, the second category of mitigation is really companies that support the reduction of emissions. And you know, as you referenced, you know, as Tom and I talked about, you know, emissions are really inherent in every part of our lives, and we're going to need data and information and intelligence to be able to decarbonize and, and execute against this capital stock turnover. And so, what could those companies look like? They can be software companies that collect data and analyze that data in order to help us measure and identify places where we can go and address you know, hot spots of carbon. Um, it can be consumer platforms that help us to purchase, consume more in a circular way, um, you know, to recapture materials and reuse materials to be more resource efficient. Um, renewable project developers, you know, the team that puts solar on my roof or um, deploys wind turbines you know, out in the middle of the ocean. And so those, you know, are kind of the two big categories, I think. But I don't know if that resonates, Tom. Well, it obviously does. But l let me ask you a question, because a lot of what you're talking about, Saloni, comes under the rubric of if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. Yeah. But these are huge physical systems that are causing emissions. And you're talking a lot about information, data, software, the ability to get information to manage them. Yeah. How do you think about investing from the standpoint of the huge physical systems and the, the information systems that allow those systems to work yeah. more efficiently? Look, I mean, I think ultimately the two are inextricably linked. You know, we have developed as a society to use information, use compute, use intelligence to do everything that we do. And the way that we decarbonize will be similarly deploying that type of intelligence um, to allow us to do things better, faster, greener, and cheaper. And so in California, you know, in just this past, gosh, this past month, we had a heat wave, you know, another record heat wave as we have, and California was able to actually avoid blackouts, which they had not been successful in avoiding in the past and even less severe circumstances, by sending pretty loud but targeted alerts to people's phones to tell them they must reduce load now. And so in this, you know, this new, this new sector of our energy con economy called demand response, they were able to intelligently identify what nodes do we need to reduce power at, or reduce consumption. If we reduce consumption, we can actually avoid system-wide or you know, more mm -hmm. broad blackouts. And so you know, it's a small example. Farmers, you know, we reference precision agriculture. Um, you know, farmers are taking in, you know, we waste two-thirds of the nitrogen fertilizer we apply, or why we, you know, it's sort of like the old advertising adage, 50% of advertising is not effective, but we don't know which 50%, so we continue to do it all. So by giving farmers the tools to identify these are the plants that need it. This is when it is most effective to apply. Don't apply just before a rainfall where it's going to get washed away and run off and actually create you know, another externality and polluted groundwater. We can both help farmers drive better ROIs, reduce their input costs, while actually reducing the externalities that come from nitrogen production and application. So, so it's critical. Saloni, you're, ta you're talking about putting together the information of the 21st century to manage systems all of which started before the 21st century. That's right. And, and you've said two of them, which is agriculture yes. and electricity generation. What, what are the big physical systems that we really have to primarily address to make this work? Yeah, I think if you ask, you know, various climate modelers use different frameworks, but the big ones, you know, that I like to think about are power, certainly the, the biggest one, you know, power generation. 
Um, but power generation then feeds into a lot of industries. You know, we talked about agriculture, things like fertilizer production, building, so the operations of a building, you know, not just the lights, but also the conditioning is a huge source of power consumption. Transport, we're trying to electrify transport. Um, so increasingly our cars are electric. We're working to get our buses and trucks and other modes of transport, our trains also running on electricity. And then the another huge one in terms of an emission source is industry. So cement and steel each account for 8% of global emissions. And that's not just the energy that goes into producing those commodities but actually the process emissions, the calcination of limestone is half of the emissions that cement, that you know, occur in cement production. And you know, we talked earlier about needing to decouple emissions from population growth and from development. You, know, you think about how foundational cement and steel are to development and growth. You know, we need to decarbonize those processes in order to enable development while also decarbonizing our future. And I'd say there's one last physical system. So those are five kind of incumbent economy, big physical systems. The last one is one that really doesn't exist yet today at scale, but we need to create a new one, and that is carbon removals. So nature gave us you know, trees and plants that are little carbon capture machines themselves. We need to continue to support and you know, farm regeneratively, you know, sequester carbon in the soil, sequester carbon in trees we plant, but also drive engineered removals, which are sucking carbon out of the air because we need to suck carbon out of the air and put it back where well, it came Well, I think from. it's really important to point out in, in terms of what you're saying, in terms of sequestration, is that we're not trying to get to, net, to zero. We're trying to get to net zero. That's right. That we know will still be there emitting are some CO2. some things that will just be very, very But very it's hard going to be to a net zero. And I think the other thing that you can hear loud and clear in what you're saying, Saloni, is that these are big physical systems that exist. So of course, this is gonna be a process of replacing them and doing things in a new way. You talk, you know, we're not gonna have completely different electricity generation tomorrow. Yep. That's why we need to get going immediately because we can't replace those systems overnight. Absolutely, and we also, you use the word systems a few times. I think it's also really important, you know, I talked about these emissions wedges. Unfortunately, it's not so simple as, okay, just great, go and electrify transport. Because what happens when you electrify transport? Well, so you go from mobility, and then you hop over to power, and say, well, now we need to make sure that the electrons we're producing are green. The vast majority of the electrons we produce in the US today are not green. And so we need to green our grid at the same time that we're electrifying the actual vehicles we drive around in, which, oh, by the way, is gonna place a lot more stress on our actual like transmission and distribution infrastructure. So we need to be smart about it. We need to actually enable demand response. We need to actually deploy the software that will allow us to manage charging. So all of these changes need to happen in tandem. They need to be enabled by information and data that cuts across these silos and siloed actors in our economy need shared intelligence to be able to make decisions in response to one another. Um, and we need to get really good at that really fast. And, and taking a step further than you just went, it's also true that if we're gonna electrify transport, those batteries are gonna acquire minerals that mm -hmm. we don't produce right now in any kind the size that's necessary when we're talking about no internal combustion vehicles sold Absolutely. after 2035. So it really it's is the a- the remaking of our economy, Tom. You know, those minerals we're not producing in that scale today because we don't have that level of demand for battery minerals. But if we need to decarbonize that fast, mining is not typically thought of as like an incredibly nimble overnight activity, right? So what we need to do is to be able to quickly, you know, get more efficient and also think about being mindful of the impacts on the earth as we do an activity that is, you know, fundamentally like changing the face of the earth in, in terms of mining um, to be able to get the materials we need and then recycle those batteries when they come to end of life. I mean, these are it's never ending, right? The ways in which our economy needs to be remade. And that's the point. It's vast, but it's also so multifaceted and such a huge array of opportunities Absolutely. for transformation. And new companies that need to be built.
Saloni, can you expand why now? Why is now the right time to invest in climate? Oh, great question. I think Tom has done a really uh, nice job establishing the urgency of the moment. We also see just this really remarkable flywheel of all the different parts of society and kind of just economic actors coming together to create a really powerful moment right now. And I think the first piece of that that really has to underpin it is just the ROI is the returns are there. The technology has gotten so compelling. The cost per kilowatt hours have come down. We are able to take advantage of all of the declines in the cost of compute, in satellite imagery, and all of these things to actually underpin some really compelling business models to drive decarbonization. You're seeing talent, and this is really, you know, again, very much interplays with the technology development. You're seeing talent, their best and brightest, saying that this is where they want to spend their time. They want to align their professional time with their values. You're also seeing people as consumers wanting to do the same thing, something like 80% of consumers saying they want to, to consume more sustainably. I think employees, talent, consumers are then pushing corporations, society is pushing corporations to align their business models with a net zero future. So you've seen a lot of corporates make some pretty bold statements, intentional ones. <laughs> I think it's one third of large public companies today, up from one fifth a couple of years ago, have net zero objectives. And then the money is following those things. It's following the talent, it's following the business models, it's following the corporate commitments. Um, and you're seeing a lot of capital get put behind climate solutions. You know, the, I think the first half of this year, climate tech companies raised 50% more than they did in the first half of last year. I think overall, it's an $800 billion energy transition spend in 2021. And I think finally, you know, policymakers, all of this adds up to a society and economy that you can't, policymakers now need to also align, you know, their, their work with the will of the people and of the markets. And so whether it's SEC, you know, draft climate disclosure regulation or in the EU, SFDR or other measures, I think all of those different elements of society, you know, so technology, talent, consumers, corporates, capital markets, and then policymakers really feel like they're all lining up in a way that the climate action we need is going to happen. And it is really just a matter of, as you said earlier, how, what's it going to look like? Well, I mean, I think it's really important, Saloni, to remember this didn't, we didn't just get here there has been at least 15 years of work, both in terms of investment and development of technology to get us to a place where we can win in the marketplace. Yeah. And over that time, there's been at least 15 years of concerted effort to push society, to push policymakers and consumers and citizens to be aware of this issue and to bring them forward to a place where they're not just aware of it, but insisting on the changes that we need. So, I mean, it does remind me a little of the old Hemingway quote, how did it happen slowly and then all at once? Mm -hmm. Well, I think we're at the place where we need that explosion of yeah. change. And honestly, the numbers you were giving in terms of capital, you know, that we're <laughs> up 50%, that there's $800 billion, $800 billion by any measure is a lot of money. Yeah. And it's also completely inadequate to this problem. Absolutely. And no, so I that, think that you're we need right. something very big, very quick, and we need that kind of slowly and then all at once. Yeah, the end of that sentence, I think, is the, the numbers range based on what you look at. But I think it's four and a half trillion a year for the next 30 years that we need to get to a net zero future. And that, you know, there's some assumptions in there about how well we spend it and how efficiently we spend it. But, you know, the number needs to quintuple from where we are today. And I think the other thing that's really true in answer to Caitlin's question about why now is, this is gonna, these are huge physical systems that are gonna have to be changed over time. We can't just snap our fingers and have a new electric grid or a new electricity generation plants in every country in the world. So it's going to take time. But I think that, you know, it's going to be rolling thunder through yeah. all the sectors, you know, and, and why don't you go through and, and talk about 
what that process is going to look like so that we don't just win in the short term, but we're build, you know, we're yeah. compounding success in the marketplace, winning in the marketplace. Well, and I think this is the point that the technology advancements are not just that lowering cost per kilowatt hour. It's not just solar panels and wind turbines, which have been phenomenal progressions in terms of the cost declines and in terms of the efficiency gains, but also the utilization of kind of just the the advancements in technology we have and our ability to ingest massive quantities of really dense, you know, hyperspectral imagery data generated from satellites orbiting the Earth once daily that we can actually develop a full satellite fleet to orbiting the Earth once daily where we can get this incredible picture of where deforestation is going to happen because we see the roads being built, you know, where we can use software tools to help us understand scope three emissions. You know, this is, as you've said, a global problem. You know, the U.S. is 11 percent of the world's emissions. The, U the EU is six. Those percentages are going down. All of the emissions are in the rest of the world. How can we take our corporate intentionality that we referenced and drive it global? It will be through supply chains, through the reduction in scope three emissions. And for them to do that, they're going to need the information to know where to target. So it really is about laying that information and data foundation that we can then drive action on top of. But I think the other thing that I really look to is the relentless, relentlessness of human growth and technology advancement. Because what we've seen in the last 15 years is taking what people said, it's too expensive, it's too slow, yep. it doesn't work to a place where we can win in the market and that relentless advancement of coming basically from human ingenuity and human thought isn't gonna stop. I mean, in fact, we need that to be much broader. We need it to be much more inclusive to drive the kind of transformational change that's required for us to solve this problem and which I deeply believe is gonna happen with investment, but with all of society pushing and supporting that kind well, of Well, and I think that is, I mean, what you're describing essentially is the scaling down of cost curves as we scale experience curves, as we deploy, as we continue to iterate, as we continue to improve, you know, and that's where stacking all of these forces on top of each other, you know, the IRA and the incentives it provides to deploy at greater scale, the consumer demand for this type of sustainable growth and consumption, the corporate intentionality where procurement managers are now saying, no, I have to go and find these new solutions. All of that together allows technologies, allows businesses to scale the experience group, get better and deliver better, faster, greener, cheaper. And look, I, th I think for an awful lot of people in the world, they can't remember a world before the internet. Mm -hmm. And yet at this point, virtually every company is internet enabled and is actually, that's a critical tool for them to behave. And it's that kind of ubiquity and awareness that has got to happen in terms of climate solutions to a point where people forget that that wasn't always something yeah. that everybody was thinking about that they didn't include in their thinking and in their decision making right. about what to buy, how to produce things and really how to run the world. When you know you give that internet example, I also think about and you describe how we can't remember a world before, you know, you think about the way development of communications infrastructure happened in the developing world and you know they skipped landlines in many places. They never dug up to lay down copper wire. They went straight to mobile phones, straight to transacting via a mobile device. And I think the developed world taking the technologies that we're developing here and enabling that type of growth in the developing world where they skip, they're able to grow and able to develop, but they skip the sort of brown stage of development that you know marked really the industrial age here in the developed world is gonna be critical. Here we go. Zooming out for a moment, what got you interested in climate? Sloni, why don't you start? Sure. Gosh, it feels like so many things kind of came together. I've, I'm the mother of two, I guess not so young girls anymore. They're 11 and nine. And I remember the day my then nine-year-old, the one who's now 11, came to me and said, Mom, I'd like to do a climate presentation for the school. 
can you help me put this together? And I know it was this moment for me of, you know, doing this work, I have felt like a core part of it is ensuring a livable future for my girls. You know, my parents came here as immigrants. Part of what every parent wants for their kids is a better life than what they had. And I feel like I've been really fortunate. And then I looked ahead to, candidly, not only my own daughters, but my family back in India and say the prospect of them having you know, a future forward looking that is of higher quality. I think I just read an article this morning about the Indian monsoons and what's happening feels like unless we take pretty dramatic action now, that probability doesn't feel very high. And so for me, it was a pretty abrupt shift about five years ago, actually seven years ago now, time flies, where I decided <laughs> this was the only work I wanted to do and I wanted to dedicate all of my you know, professional time and energy to actually moving the ball on this problem and in whatever way I could, given the background that I had as an investor. And it is one of those massive intractable problems that you just have to roll up your sleeves and start doing the work every day. Um, and I haven't looked back since. And we're better for it okay. that you are a focuser. Tom. So, um, you know, I like Saloni Multani, I'm a human being, so I have driven by human, you know, responsibilities and cares, including my family. And, you know, I really came on this problem on a family trip to Alaska where I'd worked for the summer and I wanted to show them the wilderness and I sh showed them this huge melting ice cube. And we all agreed, my God, <laughs> this is absolute clear evidence that the problem we've been reading about is very real and you know, we need to address it, and I started to address it around then as the primary goal of what I was going to do outside of my professional investing. And it kind of overtook me. But I, so I would say a huge part of this is like wanting to have a meaningful impact while I'm alive on not just the people who I love, but all the people who I don't know. And, I, and the last thing I'll say is this, look, I have discovered how seriously I take this country. This is a huge chance for us. And it's not that we're apart from the rest of the world. We're very much part of the rest of the world. But America was kind of created for this, to solve huge problems, to have high ideals, and to make a bunch of money doing it. And so I view this, my participation in this, very much as an American enterprise in the context of a global economy and a global humanity. And I feel super strongly that it can be a gigantic opportunity for us in every way to come together and to prove that our democratic and capitalist system can solve the world's problems in the most unified way. And that's how I'm viewing this problem. And yeah, there's a competitiveness, I think, that you know we, we share here. <laughs> Not us versus them, but it's so clear that this is both an imperative and a massive opportunity that demonstrating that, that, that showing how impact and return align, it's so clear that it does, and it's so clear it's such a massive opportunity, is it's probably the most motivating and inspiring you know, I've felt in my life. I, I think we have a gigantic work. chance to make a positive contribution. And that's an and that's a competitive thing. Like I would like to do that while I'm alive. Tom, what is the role of policy in addressing this crisis, and and what does the passage of the IRA mean for climate? We're looking at what is necessarily going to be a partnership between the public and private sectors, and this isn't just about our climate response. This is true of all huge societal changes. If you think about the National Highway Act in the 1950s, I mean, Congress passed the act in order to make it possible for tanks to get around the United States in case we're invaded. But what really ended up happening- I didn't know that. Oh yeah. And, and, and what really ended up happening was that it made it possible for a completely different way of transporting yeah. people around this country, of transporting goods around this country, of what development was possible, where it was possible to live in completely different ways that, were, that didn't exist before the National Highway Act. So I think anything that happens here is gonna happen in, the con in that context. 
So when we think about it, it's not just the Inflation Reduction Act. It's also the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act. It's the CHIPS Act. It's the $54 billion California budget related to climate. What we're seeing here is American policy stepping up to support the next generation, the next 10 years of climate investing and climate solutions. And so what does that mean? Well, I'd, I'd break it down into two things. One is deployment, that we take the existing technologies that exist that are being used in a significant way, but actually speed up the, the timing over which they're deployed and the scale over which they're deployed. So that would include things like solar and wind technologies, electric vehicles, charging stations, efficiency, to deploy the things that we have much faster and in bigger scale. But secondly, there's a huge part of this which is gonna support the new technologies, not the things that we're ready to scale up in next year, but the companies that are gonna develop the, the technologies that win in the marketplace and that do one of the two things that Saloni was talking about, which is either make us more resilient or mitigate the problem in the first place. And so when we think about that, that's what the United States is doing. They are supporting the investment in those technologies, deployment and creation, so that we can both deploy them here and drive down the cost curve and then deploy them around the world. That's coupled with other countries. I mean, there are all the other countries of the world are aware of this. Europe is leading very much from the standpoint of policy and those policies, rules that they're putting in that demand that you produce goods and services or produce electricity or use electricity in a new way are going to drive real corporate change, which is also going to be relevant for countries around the world. So when we think about this, you know, this is a reflection, the policy, the relationship between the public and private sectors. This is really driven by the broad societal awareness reflected in those elected officials broadly saying, we recognize this crisis. We understand that the private sector is going to have to drive executing the changes necessary for us to respond. And we're gonna give them the support that's necessary so that they can succeed and so that we can succeed together. Do you think additional policy is gonna be necessary to get this done? Well, let me say, take that in a couple of different ways. The policy that is there is more than sufficient for us to both deploy and create the new innovative companies that we're talking about. Okay. So that it is not necessary to have more policy for us to succeed with the investments we're making now. Okay. But ultimately for us to drive to that net zero world. By 2050, There right. is going to be continued change in policy just the way that you'd expect yeah. and the way that you know, it isn't like um, the National Highway Bill was the end of regulation right. of automobiles. Right, we still automobiles. maintain the roads and we you know, still and regulate. There's right. lots of things that are going to have to change. And really what we're trying to get to is a policy that supports an even playing field between all the different technologies and all the different ways of acting in these big sectors right. that you outlined, Salon. And so really what we're looking for is continued awareness of what that level playing field to let the private right. sector figure out what's the best way to solve these problems, what's the way that's the cheapest, the best, the fastest, the cleanest, and reward those people who come up with that. And when you say level the playing field, you know, there's this dynamic where, you know, the incumbent technologies or incumbent, you know, ways of producing power, say, capital's already sunk. They're just OPEX, they're just operating costs at this point. So competing with new capital deployment, often very low operating costs, but making sure that those two can compete on a level playing field. Yeah. Well, I think that's part of it. And I think a big part of the Inflation Reduction Act is making that kind of capital available for new technologies so that they don't, you know, there was this talk 10 or 15, 10 years ago about the valley of death for yep. climate tech that they couldn't get the necessary capital to really scale technologies that work. Or to show that they could. Right. They and, couldn't do the demonstration. And, and the, the Inflation Reduction Act is really to yes. take that problem off the table. Yep. That in fact, 
if you have a promising technology that makes a real difference and can work in the marketplace, they're saying we're gonna support that and make it possible for you to get to your customers, for you to scale that product, for you to make a real difference, and, and that's a real change. And scale down that experience and cost curve we were describing earlier, which is, you know, it's so essential to have those initial deployments to iterate because the, the learning curve is so steep on these early deployments for these new solutions. Look, and I think the other thing that's true here that we can very clearly see is this is going to be very much of a business financial solution where we win in the marketplace. This is capitalism. This is exactly what this system was derived to do, solve broad societal needs and demands yeah. in the most efficient and comprehensive way. And that's exactly, you know, this is gonna be a huge, in, that's the opportunity. It's a gigantic investment opportunity to solve problems with policy that supports it, but really just makes a marketplace that has a, a level playing field so the best solutions win. Why galvanize? You've both worked in climate in so many different ways. Why here? Why like this? Tom, why don't you kick it off? Well, I spent over 30 years as a financial professional, as a professional investor. And actually, that's where I met Saloni about 15 years ago. I, you know, I started a firm, Farallon, that I ran for 27 years. I was a partner at Hellman, in those same 27 years, at Hellman and Friedman on the investment committee. Uh, and I left that at 2012 to spend eight full years being an advocate for a robust American climate response. And I believe we're at a stage right now where what's appropriate and necessary is execution from the private sector. So for me, that's what we're all doing at Galvanized Climate Solutions, is trying to put together the most comprehensive and absolutely best firm in this space. It's absolutely the time, and we're trying to craft the firm that best responds to the opportunity right now. So what does that look like? There's no way you can think about putting together investment firms without starting with people. We need to have the best people in every investment activity. Otherwise, we're just not gonna do it. And so that is the first thing we need. We need experienced professionals with great track records and great knowledge and disciplined ability to drive returns. But we also are a completely mission-driven firm. So the impact is something that is internal, it is central. Our chief impact officer goes to an every, every investment committee meeting. You start with people, but then you have to get into structure. You know, are you gonna set up a firm where the, you're gonna incent the best behavior from the best people? So that means very much not having conflicts. We are very straightforward. We deliberately chose to be focused on climate solutions so that that is something which we're absolutely committed to all the time. But beyond that, we want to be the best firm in this space. That means having capability in this space that's differential. Not just investment, that we have people who are experts in policy, people who have true technology and science expertise, people who are really experts in communications, in go-to-market, so that when we're looking at a project or a company, we're not just bringing money, we're not just bringing decision-making capability, we're bringing capability for that company to succeed differentially. Because we wanna be the partners of choice for the best entrepreneurs and the best leaders in this space that they want us because we're bringing capability. And part of that is money. You know, this has been a space where traditionally money has come and gone. And what we're saying to people is when we show up, then we're gonna be there with the kind of capital you need to drive success, but to drive the broadest, fastest success we can possibly see. And we believe that impact and returns go together. If you create something that has global impact, that's by definition going to be a very valuable company. So why galvanize and how we're organizing it is really to drive the best possible returns, however you measure them, and that we're going to do it in a corporate culture that reflects the highest values and the highest aspirations of our society and of ourselves. And that means we're gonna be, we're gonna look different, we're gonna think different, and we're gonna act differently 
from a traditional Wall Street firm. Very deliberately, we're choosing to do that. And we're going to do it because we think that's the way you respond to a broad-based societal need with a, 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 a diverse and genuinely broadly based group of people. And you do it with your eye completely focused on the future, not on the past. That's what we're trying to do. Everything Tom said really resonated. And you know, for me, that, that purpose-built nature of what we're doing here, the intentionality with which we've built Galvanize, we talked earlier about kind of the six different societal forces that we believe are coming together to create a flywheel of momentum and action, time is now. And you see that reflected in what we've built here. You know, we started with the technology. All these great businesses start with great business models that have at their core some kind of a mousetrap, a technology component, a go-to-market model. We have a science and technology team that is best in class that has been working with commercializing young companies that was made to do this. We talked about talent. Bringing the best and brightest talent in to scale these companies, we need to access the best that you know, we as a global society have to bring to bear. We have a dedicated talent team in-house to help support our companies, our business builders access that talent. We talked about consumers and consumers' desire to align their values with their purchases. A huge part of that is building a communications and branding strategy so that you can tell that story about the market or the product you're building and how it connects those dots for consumers. You know, we talked about corporations and their intentionality and these individuals sitting in procurement departments who have had that job, you know, to the, the point Tom was making earlier, they've been doing this work for a long time, that procurement function, but now suddenly climate is a part of what they do. And so making the connections with them with companies building the solutions to help them deliver against their objectives, you know, that market development function, connecting those dots is really critical as well. You know, certainly, you know, Tom talked about bringing the money and bringing the impact. We really think about those two things as going together. And then, of course, the policy scaffolding we have that's happening in the EU and here in the U.S., having an in-house regulatory affairs function that can help our companies access the markets that the regulation and the incentives here in the US are creating, helping them navigate the landscape in the EU, which is also creating markets at an accelerated rate you know, over in the EU. Having that all under one umbrella, having a purpose-built team, a mission-driven, purpose-built, to your point, looking forward, looking to the economy that we are building, must build, you know, that to me is what was so compelling about you know, doing this here, doing this work here at Galvanize? Well, a lot of what you're saying is about strategy and a lot of what you're saying is about culture. And I think when you think about building something great, you have to get the culture right. And of course, we've got to be right on strategy. And I'm actually very, very confident that the strategy that we're des describing is absolutely appropriate and right for this time. But I think it's also important to remember that Strategy is easy, execution is hard. So as much as I feel very comfortable that we're doing the right thing in the right way, we still have to come into work every single morning and execute like heck so that in fact we live up to our ideals. And that's where we are. You know, we really strongly believe we've got the right culture. We strongly believe in our strategy. I think we have the right people. That's the promise of success. That's not success. Success is coming in every day and living up to that promise. And I think and you have a highly ambitious world. group of people here <laughs> who is highly ambitious about delivering against that strategy with execution, the execution it demands. Put me in that group. Let's go do it. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Saloni. This has been a phenomenal discussion. Thanks for watching. For more information, please vised our website, galvanizedclimatesolutions.com. Thank you.